What's up guys, Michael Montero with another rant video. Wanted to comment about a couple of things real quick before I get ready to watch the Dodgers play game two of the World Series against the Houston Astros. So a couple things in my mind, you know, a lot of people have been talking about drug testing and boxing. That's kind of come to the forefront again, and it seems to be just part of the overall uh, discussion in boxing in recent years, and it should be. And the clean boxing program with the WBC has come under some fire with some fans out there on Twitter and the Twitter sphere, the YouTube sphere, especially related to this whole Luis Ortiz situation and what's going on with that. And also weigh-ins, weigh-in procedures. We saw Jazreel Corrales miss weight by several pounds in his title fight last week. It was a, a super featherweight or junior lightweight title fight, whichever you prefer. And he missed weight by three or four pounds. And it looked like he didn't even try because he looked fresh in the fight. And so a lot of people have been talking about that because weigh-ins and making weight and cutting weight, that is directly related to performance enhancing drugs because a lot of the PEDs out there aren't necessarily steroids. Many of them help to aid fighters in cutting weight. And that, that's a very, very dangerous thing. So I want to touch on those two uh, things and what I think we could do in boxing to improve those procedures, the drug testing and the weigh-in procedures within the current system, because a lot of you guys asking for you know one sanctioning body or same-day weigh-ins, those days are gone. They're never coming back. We have a certain system in place, but there are things we could do within this system to make it better. Okay, so I'll get to that in a second, but I wanted to touch on something really, really quick. Um, you know. I've, some of you guys have forwarded me some uh, just tweets and posts and comments and stuff. People dissing me because I'm selling t-shirts or because I have a Patreon page or stuff like that. And some people dissing me because I post pictures of myself training at the gym or I've posted photos of myself with championship belts before or with fighters hanging out at the gym or hanging out at events or stuff like that. And a lot of people question my uh, journalistic integrity for those sorts of things, or I get called a fanboy, or I, uh, there was somebody commenting today in a YouTube video calling me a fake because I was trying to quote unquote be a tough guy in my YouTube picture, which is, I blew it up here um, just on a piece of paper so you can see which picture. It's a picture of me at the gym with wraps on. And look, I, I, I train, uh, you know, I, I, I trained a lot in my youth, but then I went well over a decade, like throughout my 20s, really where I didn't train at all. It was more weight training and stuff. But those of you who follow me, you know that I've trained in boxing for a long time, going back to when I was a kid. You also know that I'm a former athlete. I played sports at a pretty high level, several sports, and I excelled at them. I'm a big guy. I'm six foot four, 220 pounds. And even though I'm 38 years old right now, I'm nowhere near the shape that I used to be in. I competed in sports. I was an athlete. I was in the Marine Corps. I was in the military. We used to box in the Marine Corps. I don't think they do anymore. At least they don't make you do it. You can volunteer to do it. But I have some background in sports and everything, and I like to train and stay in shape. And for some people to talk trash or have some kind of, uh, I don't know, some kind of attitude, because every now and then I tweet a picture or a video of me training or something, I, I just don't understand that. It's, it's kind of weird to me. And a lot of times it's my coach, who's a former professional fighter, who has a side business where he brings in people, beginners and, and, and experienced people, and trains them. It's a side business he does. He's a trainer. So he will take pictures and, and videos and stuff with him and the guys he's training, and he'll post it on his social media. And this picture is an example of it. He gave me a Mexican-style hand wrap, and he, he loved his rap so much, he wanted to take a picture of it. And, and he wanted to get a shot of me. And I liked the picture so much. Actually, it was Tiffany, my girlfriend, who really loved it so much, that she was like, you should make that your profile pic. And I did, I think, on YouTube, or no. Yeah, YouTube, Instagram, on a couple of them. Some of you want to talk trash about that? Are you really that upset? Are you really that mad? I don't have to talk about how tough I am or am not or how rough my childhood was or anything like that. It has nothing to do with my boxing analysis and my boxing know-how. 
It doesn't matter where you're from or what level you've fought at or trained at. Do I think it helps that I've trained and I've sparred and I know how it feels to get hit? Do I think that helps me analyze a fight and know what I'm seeing and what's going on in the ring? Yeah, personally for me, because I'm a physical reactor, it's how I learn things. Yeah, I do think that helps me. Some people don't need to do it. But what I don't understand is why some of you out there got to hate. And you're the same people that will hate on other boxing writers at big platforms who are obese. And, you know, I'm sure you guys know some of the people I'm talking about. There are obese, big guys that are boxing writers. Some of them are, you know, young. Some of them are old. And they're big guys who look like they've never lifted a weight in their life, let alone box. And you're the same guys to say, I don't trust this guy or anything he's saying. He's never even boxed before. Well, here I am, a guy that even though I'm 38 years old, I'm not competing at this stage. I'm too old, but I still train. And you want to talk trash about a guy like me, too. I don't understand that you're being hypocrites. And I'm not pretending to be a professional fighter or anything like that. I love boxing. I love being in shape. I love being healthy. Naturally, I'm at the gyms all the time anyway. I know people at the gyms all over town. I live in Los Angeles, the mecca of boxing. I'm going to go train. And guess what? A lot of the guys that you follow, the Steve Kims, the Doug Fishers, all those guys, they train every week too. So get over yourselves and your hypocrisy. As far as me selling t-shirts and having a Patreon page, I don't charge any of you for my content. I don't really get paid that much either. I get paid a little bit through Google because I'm a Google partner through my YouTube channel. I get paid through Boxing Monthly Magazine when I post a, an article or something like that. I get paid for some of the radio spots and things that I do here or there, but it's nickel and dime stuff, okay? A lot of the platforms, the media platforms you guys trust and love, they're charging you for, you know, quote unquote, like exclusive access to watch videos and stuff like that. There's certain free material, and then you gotta pay extra for the good stuff. And you know who I'm talking about. And a lot of you guys are paying that money. You're, and you're the same guys complaining that I'm selling t-shirts to help raise money for my independent platform that I've grown from the ground up. Again, it doesn't make sense, and you're being hypocrites. And what a lot of you don't realize is that a lot of the boxing media platforms right now, they're propped up by promoters, they're propped up by big network deals. The PBC, right, and, and all the network time buys they were doing. There are certain websites, certain media entities that are owned by the parent companies of those networks, and it all filters down. And if you don't think that they were doing fluff pieces for the PBC, and by the way, the PBC is not the only one, okay? Golden Boy Promotions owns Ring Magazine, so take from that what you will. But... They were doing that for PBC, and there's several people in the Boxing Writers Association of America who are indirectly being paid through a network contract through Uncle Al, or whether it's Oscar De La Hoya or whoever. There are some media publications that are being propped up by sanctioning organizations. The WBC is the biggest offender there. I've opined about this stuff, and I've talked to you guys about this many, many times if you follow my work. You guys don't want to complain about that stuff, or some of you do. But then you want to get mad because I'm selling the t-shirt? My whole thing is I stay independent. And believe me, I've had offers to work exclusively with certain entities, with certain entities. And, but they would control and limit what I could say, how I could say it, what I could write about, how I could write, what I can't say, things like that. And I'm just not going to go there because I have... Again, if you follow me, you know this about me. I dabble in the entertainment industry. I've worked in the entertainment industry. I've lived here in Los Angeles since 2010. I've done several different things over the years in all aspects of the entertainment business. Uh, in front of a microphone, in front of a camera, behind those things, producing, writing, stunts. I've done a bunch of it. I have friends that are high up in the business and I talk to them. I know how this thing works. When you start doing favors for people, you start owing people favors, you become owned. And I don't want to do that. So I stay independent. So if I ask that those of you who can contribute to my Patreon page and want to, to please do so, what is so wrong about that? 
If I want to sell t-shirts to help promote my brand and take that money and funnel it back into my channel and keep it growing, and by the way, I'm going to have a big announcement next week about our next big growth thing that's happening here at Montero Unboxing. We're about to, we've taken some of the money we've raised and already put it back into something. We have something to announce for you guys next week. We have plenty more to come down the road. But if I want to do that so I can stay independent and keep speaking my mind and telling you guys the, just how I see it, the way I see it, what is so wrong with that? Why do some of you got to hate? All right, enough of that. I've spent 10 minutes rambling on that and I wanted to spend 60 seconds. Let's get to the good stuff. WBC Clean Boxing Program. Now, a lot of you still mistake what the Clean Boxing Program is versus full VADA testing. All right, so the Clean Boxing Program is paid for through the WBC, the World Boxing Council. And you guys, if you, if you follow it, then you know that the top 15 rated fighters in each division, there's 17 divisions, so that's 255 fighters. They give that list to VADA, Voluntary Anti-Doping Association or Agency. Can't remember off the top of my head. And they give them a budget. I believe it's a quarterly budget. And they say, randomly test. WBC has absolutely no say over who gets tested or when. And there's a lot of misinformation about that, that certain fighters are getting preference and other fighters are not. They have no say. They give the list of rated fighters and a budget to VADA. VADA tests randomly at their discretion until the budget is emptied out. And therein lies the problem because the WBC's budget for the clean boxing program is pretty much microscopic, at least compared to where it needs to be. The budget is four figures. It needs to probably be six figures a year, okay? Or a quarter, a quarter. Yeah, I'm saying it. So anyway, that's the way, now let, let me say this. When a fighter is tested through VADA, they do the same panel every test, okay? They're testing for the same things. They have their own WADA, World Anti-Doping Association Agency, whatever A word, sets the, the prohibited substances list. VADA actually adds a couple things, and they really don't care about certain ones, but if it pops up, they'll look for it. But um, when it comes to like marijuana and stuff like that, that's not really a performance enhancer. That's more to a, a state athletic commission's discretion. They're looking for performance enhancing drugs set by WADA. And of course, we know that there's certain drugs where the jury's still out. We're not going to get into all that right now. But VADA's testing for all that stuff with every test. It doesn't matter if it's one test here that's with the clean boxing program or a dozen tests over here with full VADA testing for an entire fight camp. They're testing for the same stuff. What full VADA testing is, is when two fighters or one, but generally speaking for a big fight, it's, it's both fighters contractually agree to pay for at their own expense. Remember, it's the Voluntary Anti-Doping Association to, for full testing throughout fight camp. Even on the day of the fight, even after the fight, they're being tested. And both guys will be tested multiple times, multiple places, okay, multiple ways. So it might be during fight camp. It will be during fight camp, but it also might be during fight week. It might be right after the weigh-in. It might be right before the fight or the morning of the fight. They won't, they won't go right before the fight, but they'll go right after the fight. So that is paid for by the fighters. An example of that would be like when Gennady Golovkin fought Canelo Alvarez, or earlier this year when Vladimir Klitschko fought Anthony Joshua. Those guys were tested multiple times. Between those two fights, there were dozens of tests performed, okay? However, as great as that sounds, and as great of a gesture as it is by the fighters to do it, if you're a fighter who only fights once a year, in theory, you could be using performance enhancing drugs. Let's say, I don't know, let's say you fight in September. Well, January through June, you could be using, you could be doing all kinds of stuff. You could cycle up, so like, you know, get all the benefit of those drugs and then cycle off over the summer. Camp starts in July. You could start being tested in July and then boom, you fight in September, right? And you could come up clean in theory. And there are ways to mask things. There's all kinds of stuff. This is a cat and mouse game with the performance enhancing drugs testing. And it's a live 
living situation. You can't just set a protocol and keep it there because the athletes, the, the testing people are here, the athletes are here. And then the testing people catch up, the athletes raise their game. Testing people catch up, athletes raise their game. It's not necessarily the athletes, it's their teams, it's the doctors, it's the people around them that know the science and try different things and it works. Some guys get popped, a lot of guys don't. So, clean boxing program. Some people have questioned whether it's corrupt, whether it's protecting certain WBC fighters and this, that, and the other. I really don't believe that. Look, you guys know I have a lot of problems with the WBC, a lot. But to say that what they're, they made this elaborate scheme to spend, you know, a good, they spend five figures a year paying for the testing. To do that and create this whole program, all the money that's cost them, now it's cost them well into the six figures, this whole thing, this whole endeavor. To go about all that, to protect Deontay Wilder, who doesn't bring them nearly the amount of money in sanctioning fees as several other star fighters out there who are defending the WBC title and care about it, like let's say a Gennady Golovkin. It doesn't make sense. Gennady Golovkin's two purses this year against Danny Jacobs and Canelo Alvarez, the sanctioning fees from those two fights and the lead up to it and the whole, the whole deal to the WBC is more than they've ever made from Deontay Wilder. And why would they protect Deontay Wilder, Wilder against somebody like Alexander Povetkin, if you want to go back a couple years, when Alexander Povetkin having that WBC title and fighting over in Russia would bring then 10 times the amount of sanctioning fees than Wilder would provide? It doesn't make sense financially. So why the hell would they do that? Just to help out their boy, Uncle Al, doesn't make sense. So do I think it's corrupt? Do I think that they, they're purposely misleading people? No. But do I think it's a flawed program? Of course. It's a new program and it needs work. So, okay. Here's some suggestions from me. I'm just one guy here with an opinion of how we can make this thing a little bit better. For starters, the clean boxing program, as I mentioned, it's the top 15 rated fighters in each division who are tested. The problem with that is not all fighters are the same. Title holders should be held to a much higher drug testing standard than the number 12th ranked junior flyweight who may only fight once a year or something, right? The titleist, if you're holding the title, the WBC title for any division, you should be tested 10 times or more a year, whether you fight once or three times. Guys rated below that, maybe you test them four or five times a year. You vary the testing depending on, you know, a guy with the world titles tested this many times, and it's standard. Hey, if you hold a title, you're going to be tested X amount of times. And I'm just throwing out numbers, guys. I don't know what these numbers are or what it looks like. I'm just throwing out numbers here, okay? I'm, I'm just going off the top of my head. But let's say it's 10 times a year if you're a titleist, world titleist. Let's say if you hold a regional title or an interim title or something like that. Let's say it's six times a year or something. I don't know. I'm throwing out a number. And if you rate it in the top 15, let's say it's four times a year. You might get tested four times in the first quarter of the year, or it might be once per quarter for the whole year. You don't know. It's at Vada's discretion. You might get tested before a fight. You might be tested in between fights, up to Vada's discretion. But let's start with that. Let's hold different fighters to different standards, because I don't know about you guys, but I know the big fights... The guys fighting in pay-per-views, the guys fighting on HBO, Showtime, those are generally the guys who either have titles or are fighting for titles. I want them tested more than a kid who's 8-0 and and just cracked the top 15 on the WBC's ratings for whatever division. Or a journeyman or a you know, fringe contender guy who has a record of 20-15 and 15 and fights a few times a year basically to serve as cannon fodder for prospects coming up. I don't need to see that guy tested as much as a titleist. So there's a big, big nuance that I'd like to see written into the clean boxing program to help that thing get better. Also, and I've already talked about this, much, much bigger budget. I'm talking 10 times the amount it is right now. This thing needs to be several hundred thousand dollars a year's worth of testing. You have over 250 fighters. And if we're talking about testing 
the 17 world champions the WBC has, 10 times a year, start to do the math on that, guys. Thousands and thousands of tests a year to be conducted. And let's remember, boxing is a global sport. It's all over the world. So you're going to have fighters all over the place that need to get tested. There's a certain amount of travel. There's shipping. There's all kinds of costs that are involved in that. And VADA has to guarantee the, the chain of custody from when the test is conducted to when it gets to the lab to when the lab resorts, uh, results are reported. There's an entire chain of custody and that costs money because you have to certify shipping. People have to sign off on documents. It's an elaborate procedure that costs money. And VADA is not in this to make money. They're not like USADA who's making money hand over fist in their UFC deal and they're willing and dealing with Mr. Al Heyman, particularly Floyd Mayweather, uh, Al Heyman clients, but particularly Floyd Mayweather in recent years. USADA's making a ton of money. VADA's not in this for the money. They're not making a profit. The officers that work for VADA do it for free. And do you know why? Because they're rich. The people who volunteer to do this stuff, they're wealthy, they're retired, they don't need the money. Trust me, I've met them, I've been to some of their houses. They're amazing. So, all right. Last but not least, with this clean boxing program, you can, right now, the way our system is set up with all the different sanctioning organizations, you can have a fighter like Canelo Alvarez who could tell the WBC to uh, get lost, right? And he can fight for another title. He doesn't need the WBC. He's above that. So what you got to do is get the other sanctioning organizations involved. Now, the WBA just announced a program, but it's weak. It's a lot weaker and heavily more flawed than the WBC. It really is just an empty gesture. I think the WBC's gesture actually has some meat behind it. But the WBA's is totally empty right now. Through the Association of Boxing Commissions, there needs to be some sort of uniformity in similar programs with the four major sanctioning organizations. And I will list, or I'll, I'll provide a link for the ABC. For those of you who aren't familiar with the ABC's unified rules and how all that works and what the Association of Boxing Commissions does, but I think this needs to go through them. I think that through them with a, a uniformed standards, uniform standards so that, because look, each sanctioning organization, if they do a testing program, they're going to put their own name to it, right? Because they all got to be unique and put their own little spin on it. Fine. But there needs to be some uniformity with the standards. And that needs to be set and regulated by the ABC. You guys who have watched uh, Boxing After Dark on HBO when Harold Letterman gets on there and talks about the unified rules of the Association of Boxing Commissions. He talks about no standing eight count, no three knockdown rule, blah, 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 right? That's all set by the ABC. Why can't these drug testing programs all have some uniform standards? There might be a little nuance between them depending on how the sanctioning bodies all want to pay for it and stuff. And not all sanctioning bodies have the same budget. The WBC is the biggest the WBA, they're right up there with them. The IBF and the WBO are lesser. You know, they have a smaller budget to work with. So um, if they're not going to be able to put up as much money. But there needs to be some uniformity with the, the testing standards. You set that to the ABC, you get all four sanctioning organizations going with programs like this. And then suddenly, boom, you've got thousands of tests being performed across the board all year long with guys who are active, inactive, champions, uh, prospects, contenders, all of it, right? If you're rated, in the, maybe it's the top 10 in each division, maybe not the top 15. I don't know. Again, throwing out numbers here. But if you have that happening under the current system, because those of you who ask for, we only need one sanctioning body, guys, those days are gone. We're, we're never going back to one champion per division. Boxing's too globalized. It used to really be a North American, a, a USA sport, if you looked at who was regulating it, particularly New York, they used to basically run the sport of boxing professionally. Those days are gone. And now it's truly, truly global. So all four of these major sanctioning buyers are going to have to work together. And if we're going to do drug testing and do it the right way, they all got to get on board. Got to be some uniformity there. Okay, I keep repeating myself. So that's it with the drug testing. Now let's talk about the weigh-in procedures. Now, again, those of you who want same-day weigh-ins and you talk about it, never going to happen. It's just not going to happen. In the world we live in right now, especially with promoters wanting to hype up big pay-per-view events, that Friday afternoon weigh-in that they can stream live on ESPN Sports Center or maybe it's Sky over there in the UK, whatever network, 
that helps build up interest and promote a fight. And it's, it's an extra 24 hours of hype where you can pack in thousands, sometimes tens of thousands into these arenas. Sometimes you charge five or ten dollars for these weigh-ins. There are promoters making thousands of dollars off freaking weigh-ins now. And almost all of them now are streaming it live. It helps hype their, their fight up on social media. Guys, it ain't going away. It's the system we have. We have to find a way to work with it and make it better. The issue is that with that 24 to 30 hours or so between the weigh-in and the fight, we have guys blowing up. Also, though, there are guys who might only fight once or twice a year. That's the world we live in now because there's so few TV dates. Guys don't fight 10 times a year anymore. So you might have a guy who's, let's say, he's a welterweight, and he fights once a year, but between fights he weighs 190 pounds. And then he has to try to kill himself to make 147. Some guys are disciplined, and, and you never see them higher than 160 a year. You know, 160 at any point in the year, whether they're active or not. You know, welterweights, they're, they're staying right there within 10, 15 pounds of their weight class all year. They live like professional athletes. But there's very few of those boxers anymore. There's a lot of guys who blow up in between fights. And in this age of inactivity, that kills guys. There's science science behind this that shows that dehydrating your brain, the, the, the effects it has on your brain, the effects it has on some of your internal organs, literally takes, it sheds life off of guys, their life expected. It, it sheds years off of it. And it can actually affect people's health in a fight because they're not quite right. Because really, their training camp was fat camp. And by the time they get to the ring, we've seen it a million times. They look horrible, right? We see examples of it all the time. And then we get the weight bullies. The guys like Jazreel Corrales last weekend against Machado didn't even try to make the weight, didn't even care. Yeah, he got stripped of his title. He had to pay out, I think, $90,000 or so, a good chunk of his purse, but he still made a good six-figure purse. So in the end, he didn't care. We, So that's the situation. Okay. I wanted to talk about a couple of things. And look, there's, this doesn't just happen in small fights like the Jazz Real Corrales situation. It also happens in big fights. Remember, going back, this is going back a few years, but when Floyd Mayweather fought Juan Manuel Marquez and they were supposed to fight at a catchweight and Floyd didn't even try to make it. He was making so many millions of dollars in that fight, he just showed up at the weigh-in and said, here's a few extra bucks, Juanma. Here you go. Boom. That's it. And he wanted to come into the fight with a weight advantage. And under the, the deal that, you know, the contract there, there was so much on the line. Juan Manuel Marquez wanted that big, big payday. He went along with it. And as it turns out, Floyd really didn't need the extra weight, but he weight bullied him. And then we get situations like earlier this year, pay-per-view fight, Gennady Golovkin, Daniel Jacobs, the second day weigh-in with the IBF. Daniel Jacobs didn't even try it. He, did, he didn't want to go to it. He blew way, way up. He was a cruiserweight on fight night. And Golovkin was... A super middleweight. No, he was probably a light heavyweight. You know, he wasn't a full-fledged light heavyweight, but he was kind of a big super middleweight against a cruiserweight on that fight. So how can we fix all this? Okay, well, for starters, I like the WBC's 30-day and 7-day weigh-in rule. I like that. And I wish the other sanctioning organizations would do something similar. And again, this would be regulated through the Association of Boxing Commission, so there's some uniformity. But I like the 30-day and the 7-day because it shows that a guy isn't boiling himself from a crazy, crazy, unhealthy weight to get down to his fight weight. It also shows that if one, if one guy is way off, the other fighter knows about it. Because what, the worst thing is when you have one guy killing himself to make a weight and the other guy is not even trying. Or maybe he's making somewhat of an effort, but him and his team know they're, they're not going to make it. So they stop trying. So you have one guy killing himself, one guy really not killing himself at all, just not telling his opponent. And then they just show up for the weigh-in and don't make it. And it's up to this fighter here who's been busting his butt to say, do I cancel this fight or do I go along with it? You go back to the situation between Jose Luis Castillo and Diego Corrales. This is exactly what uh, Castillo did to Corrales in the second fight. And Corrales went along with it. He had killed himself to make weight. Castillo clearly did not even try that hard. 
And what happened in the fight? Castillo was much stronger, much fresher, knocked out Corrales. Then in the third fight, he tried to do the same thing to him. At one point, though, Castillo's people, they knew he couldn't make weight. There was no way. And he really was trying at that point, Castillo was. But they didn't tell Team Corrales. If they would have told Team Corrales, they could have met at some kind of catch weight or worked it out. But as it, as it turned out, when Castillo couldn't make the weight, Corrales said, you know what, screw it. We're not doing it again. I'm, I'm not going through it. I went through in the rematch. And the fight was off. And people had spent all this money, all this time promoting it. Fans had bought tickets, all, and it was gone. So we see this too much. And the WBC 30 and 7 day pre-fight weigh-ins, the fighters have to weigh in with a certain percentage of the contracted fight weight. I don't remember it off the top of my head. It helps prevent that. I like that. Ask yourself this. When is the last big WBC title fight where one guy not making weight was an issue? I can't think of one. We've seen it with WBA, IBF, WBO. But I can't think of one with the WBC recently that comes to mind. So that shows that that rule has some merit to it. Now, the IBF rehydration rule. You know, a lot of people don't like this rule. I like it because you don't allow one guy to, un, in an unhealthy way, kill himself to make weight the day before a fight and then blow up for 24 hours. That's unhealthy. And there are guys who are doing things unnaturally to cut down and wait the 24 hours before a fight and then going nuts to blow back up. And you see 15, 20 pound weight changes with some of these guys. It's not a healthy way to live. I think the IBF program is flawed though, because I think it's just, you have to come in uh, 10 pounds or less than what you weighed in at. I don't like that because if you have a minimum weight fighter, he gets to blow up to 115 if he wants, but a cruiserweight fighter can only go up to 210. That doesn't make much sense. It should be based on body mass index, a percentage, just like the WBC's rule is. What I would like to see, okay, my suggestion for all this is a program that all sanctioning organizations can get on board with. They all have their little version of it with their own little name and their own little nuance. But a program that's similar to the drug testing program, to the clean boxing program, where the top 10 or 15 rated fighters in each division have to weigh in periodically. Maybe it's every 60 days, maybe it's every 90 days, and they have to come in within a certain percentage of the weight of the division they fight in. So let's say if, let's say it's 20% for Let's start with champions, because just like the drug testing program, I think this needs to be based on who the fighter is, because not all fighters are the same. But maybe champions have to weigh in between, uh, within 20%. So if you're the cruiserweight champion, and you might only fight once this year, let's say, but you have to weigh in several times a year, and you can't be any heavier than 240 pounds. Some of you out there might think that this is ridiculous, but ask yourself this. If there's a cruiserweight champion walking around weighing 270 pounds in between fights, is he really a freaking cruiserweight? Does he deserve to have a cruiserweight championship belt if he's representing whatever sanctioning organization as their cruiserweight champion and he's blowing up to 250, 260 pounds between fights? Is that really a cruiserweight? I think if you're a champion, you should be held to a higher standard. And maybe 20% isn't good enough. Maybe it should be 10 or 15%. I don't know. Again, throwing out numbers here, guys. Let me hear your suggestions. But I want to see champions have to weigh in every 60 days. Even if you fight once or twice a year, even if you haven't fought in six months, you need to be, if you have that title, you need to be weighing in with a certain percentage of the division, the title that you are representing. Now, for the other top, 10, 15 rated fighters, maybe it's within 30%, 25%. I don't know. But even if you're just a contender, if you're rating yourself as a bantamweight, a 118 pound fighter, but you're walking around at the buffet at 165 pounds, you're not a freaking bantamweight. Not at that time. So why are you rated as a bantamweight? You should have to weigh in, report, digitally so it goes right to the sanctioning organization provide photographic evidence whatever it is maybe a commission official comes out and sees it and, and observes whatever 
but you should have to weigh in periodically to show that you're within 15%, 20% of the Bantam weight weight limit. You follow what I'm saying here? And if every sanctioning organization did this with their top-rated fighters in all the divisions year-round, you might be rated in the IBF, you might be rated in the WBO, you might be rated in all of them. So you're doing tons of weigh-ins all over the place. Either way, it's good for the sport because guys are weighing where they should be conducting themselves like professional athletes so that they're not killing themselves to make weight. And this all correlates back to performance-enhancing drugs because, as I said before, there are tons of athletes out there, and it's not just in boxing. It's in any sport where you got to cut weight. They're taking performance-enhancing drugs to help cut weight or... They're doing dangerous things with their diets. A lot of these guys aren't educated on how dangerous the stuff that they're doing to their bodies is. And a lot of people are just dehydrating themselves. And if you're dehydrating your brain right before going into combat or your brain's going to take direct trauma, not a smart move. So I think let's improve the weigh-in procedure with a program like the clean boxing program let's expand these programs the drug testing and the weigh-in programs to all the sanctioning organizations with some uniform standards set by the abc the association of boxing commissions let's hold titleists to a higher standard than rated fighters i want to see titleists weigh in more have more stringent weigh-ins and be drug tested more but if we're going to drug test if we're going to weigh people in it should be uniform, right? It should, it's the same standards. If we're going to test people, let's test for the same thing every damn time. So, and of course, one nuance. If a fighter is injured or there's some sort of medical issue, they can get an exemption from the weigh-in rule. I get it. We can always have protections in there for crazy one-off situations. So I wanted to make sure I got that in there as well. And if look, if you have a fighter who holds a title, for whatever weight class and they come in overweight, boom, they're stripped. That's it. You strip them the same way you'd strip them if they weighed in right before a fight. And then you prevent guys coming in overweight like we just saw with Jasmine Corrales against Machado last weekend. Okay? So let me know what you guys think about these ideas. I mean, I've thought about this. I get asked these questions a lot. And again, pie in the sky... If we could all have one champion per division, if we could go back to same-day weigh-ins, that'd be awesome. Ain't happening. Ain't happening under this current system. So what can we do in this current system to make this thing work? Those are my suggestions. Let me hear your guys' suggestions, comments. Like, share, subscribe. Check out the Patreon page. Check out a t-shirt. I'll see you at the fights.